So this Sabbath, we are going to look at the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1. Let's start with another prayer. Loving God, I pray that it will not be my voice that we hear, but that will be your voice speaking to us through scriptures, that you would take this and multiply it to bless all of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Have you ever seen an angel? You think so? I wish that I, well, I, growing up, I always wished that I could see an angel, that I could have a miracle story, something like this, and experience that, uh, that miraculous appearance. And I used to read that book, um, The Angels Among Us, those stories of the the angels who save people from situations like car accidents or, or they showed up as a stranger. I'm like, man, that's really cool. <laughs> I think that's awesome. And then there was that show, uh, Touched by an Angel, that people used to watch that kind of ages me, I guess, because <laughs> it hasn't aired in a while. But um, Touched by an Angel, and that was really just when people would watch it, they'd be like, wow. To be able to experience that when an angel just shows up and, and, and God works to them to do some type of miraculous thing, that just, wow, that's just really cool. Well, my whole life I grew up wanting that experience but, but, um, but never having it until December 2012. My husband, Kevin, and I were in Chicago, downtown Chicago. I hesitate to tell the story because you, like me, um, might also be very skeptical, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, so my husband, Kevin, and I were there in, in downtown Chicago to do ministry together for, for a week. And we actually, at the time, we were both in the seminary studying, um, but we were just dating. We've only, we'd only been dating maybe five months or so. Um, but we were excited to do ministry. We felt like God was calling us to do something together there in the city of Chicago. So we went downtown, and we found, we, we were hungry. We were looking for somewhere to eat. And somewhere we could sit, and we could plan this ministry that we were going to do in the church and in the downtown area there in Chicago. So as we parked, we started walking down the street, and there was this homeless man. And he was like, can you spare some change? And we're like, no, we don't have any cash. So then we, we just kind of kept walking, and he kept walking with us. It wasn't just like around the corner. It was like a significant, you know the downtown where you just you find a parking, and then you have to walk a while? It was one of those situations. So we were just walking and walking, and this guy just walked with us, and he started talking to us about ministry and like some real like advice. <laughs> um, I could tell, I, I don't want to spend a long time telling you everything that he said, but it was stuff that really resonated with especially Kevin, who was standing next to him, walking with him, and I was next to him. I was mm, not so sure I wanted to stand so close. <laughs> I was a little suspicious of this guy. But they have this conversation he shares about ministry and things, and then we were getting ready to go in the restaurant, and he says, that's a nice girl. You should put a ring on her finger. This is, we've been dating, what, like five months? Interesting story. We got engaged not long after that. <laughs> it was a short uh, time dating, and we got engaged and, and married six months later. But when you know, you know, right? We, we knew, we knew. So, but we go into the restaurant, and we sit, we sit down, and Kevin asked me, so who do you think that guy was? I was like, hmm. I don't know, but it was weird. <laughs> He's like, could it be, could he have been an angel? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know if God would actually, like, who are we? Who, who are we? God would just show up and talk to us through an angel? That, that just seems weird. And I was dealing with some skepticism stuff, you know, coming out of college, like, uh, I don't know if all that stuff is really, like, I, I believe it, but mm, still struggling a little bit with that. Uh, those skeptical thoughts. So he was like, yeah, I think, I think that could have been an angel. I was like, mm, I don't know if God would really appear to us in a, as an angel. 
or, or send an angel to us through God working through that angel. Uh, because who are we? So we walk out. After just having this conversation, we're walking again towards our car, and there's this guy, another homeless man, and he's standing, like, standing there. You know, like, when you, you look at someone and they're, like, watching you? This guy, I'm serious, was standing there watching us and just waiting for us. So we walk up to him, and he takes his hands. He puts them on either one of our shoulders. He says, brother and sister, I have a message for you. I'm like, <laughs> um, he said, receive God's grace. Go out into the community. Share God's love with others. He had us repeat John 3.16. And share God's love with others and bring them home. And we're like, okay. And we keep walking. And it was like we were walking on clouds. You know that thing, like something happened, but it didn't really happen? Like, did that really happen? So we go to the car, and Kevin said he looked back, and there was really nowhere, there like no alleys or anything. It was just this main street. He looks back, and the guy's gone. We had tingles down our spine. Like, <laughs> we're like shaking. We're like, could that have been an angel? So, I don't know, you, like everyone else, we've told the story too. We're probably skeptical and think this is probably just crazy. But for us who experience it, we really feel like we saw an angel. And it really felt that way. And I still, to this day, feel like that was an angel. So, that all to say, there's a whole lot of miraculous stuff going on in the story of Jesus and the birth of Christ. And us, like the people reading this or hearing it, are probably really struggling with some skepticism because it's all around us today. We have a lot of skepticism about, well, why would God show up to them? I mean, who are they? <laughs> he just shows up in angels and he sings songs and really, but yes. <laughs> And the people who were reading or hearing the Gospel of Matthew were Jews, most likely probably Jewish men, hearing this and thinking, I don't know, I've heard some rumors about this Jesus, and I'm not so sure that he is who you say he is, but okay. So with that being the backdrop, Matthew shares this story about how Jesus came about. That's Matthew 1, 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is one of the most popular stories of the nativity that we read, right? It's either this one or in Luke. And I find it interesting because uh, the gospel of Luke really tells Mary's side of the story. And you can tell she treasured these things in her heart. She experienced it. She saw these things. She's experiencing these things kind of through her own eyes. This story actually sees things through Joseph's eyes. This is his experience about having 
this miraculous um, appearance of an angel in a dream for him. Now, this is actually where the Gospel of Matthew begins. The Gospel of Matthew actually begins with a genealogy because Matthew is wanting to show who Jesus is first. And like I said, Jewish audience, and he's wanting to make the point that Jesus is the Messiah. So here in the beginning, he says, Jesus, this is a record of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. He wants everyone to know, first of all, two things. This is the son of David. Son of David was a term used for the Messiah who would come and save the people uh, from their oppressors. And this is the son of Abraham. Son of Abraham meaning this is the one to get the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is to go to all nations in the world, not just the Jewish nation, but to everyone. And Matthew's pushing us outward all the way. He's kind of, he's bringing in the Jewish audience, but then he's trying to challenge them to go out because at the very end, we're going to make all disciples of all nations and baptizing them, not just Jewish people, but to everyone. And here at the, the very beginning, he also, we also see that this kingdom of Jesus is not what they expected. When Jesus came, they expected him to come to conquer the Romans, to establish his government, a physical government. But Jesus comes in a different way, a very different way, to do a very different thing than they were expecting. He set up his kingdom. So the Jewish readers would read this and be like, okay, wait a minute. You say this is Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. This is the one who would be the Messiah. But where is his kingdom? We're still under the Romans. So what's happening? If you say the Messiah has come, then why haven't things changed? And Matthew's like, well, this is a different kingdom. This is a different coming. This is not what you anticipated. But this is an upside-down kingdom, one where... The Gentiles are brought in. These, these five women in, in the genealogy are, uh, the four women in the genealogy besides Mary, they are all Gentiles. They are all women. Um, so Jesus is bringing women near. He's bringing Gentiles near. He's reaching out through the Gospel of Matthew. He's touching the leper. He's drawing everyone near. This is a different kingdom. This is not the Old Testament, kind of the division between Jew and Gentile. This isn't the... Um, you know, the ceremonial law where uh, women couldn't come close, Gentiles couldn't come close. This is a God who pulls everyone into his kingdom. And uh, this is kind of the preamble to this whole story that we have a God who comes near, Emmanuel, God with us, not only to the Jewish people, but to all people. So let's look at this story. In this story, we got to know that uh, for Jews in this time period, marriage had three steps to getting married. It wasn't just like like Kevin and I, um, you know, put a ring on the finger. Oh, great! And then a lot of other things that God told us, and we're like, okay, we should get married. God says we should get married. Let's, let's do it. And then you know, proposal, ring on finger. Hey everyone, we're engaged. <laughs> and then you get, you prepare and then you get married. It was different in those days because there were three different stages. First of all, there was the engagement. And then, and, and that's kind of like an arranged situation by parents usually so that there's the engagement. And then there's the betrothal. And the betrothal is like the second step in the middle um, where the couple they're known as husband and wife, but yet they're not actually married yet. But in this arrangement, it was all, the deal was already sealed. So the only way to get out of that betrothal situation was you had to get a divorce. Um, that's really weird to us, but that's how it was. And this period of betrothal usually lasted for a year. And the marriage took place after the wedding after this year of betrothal, where they're already married, but they're not married <laughs> uh, until the wedding. So here we see 
that Mary was pledged to be married to, married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. I like this, the way that he says it. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Like someone just kind of, oh, I found you to be with child. <laughs> who was the one who found her to be with child? I, I think, you know, really it's Joseph, right? He, um, he said goodbye to Mary. She went on a trip. She comes back and she's pregnant. And he's like, Mary, what happened on the trip? <laughs> um, I'm a little concerned about this situation because you are my wife. You're betrothed to me. So what's going on? And I imagine he's saying, she, she says, well, you know, the angel came and visited me and, and told me that I was going to conceive by the Holy Spirit. And he's like, okay, this, this, this girl is a little crazy because, I mean, that story just sounds crazy, right? So he decides, because he's just, he's righteous, he doesn't want to dispose, expose her to public disgrace, but had in mind to divorce her quietly. So kind of a hush-hush situation. Okay, let's just, uh, I'm just going to divorce quietly. It wasn't really a quiet thing. That's the thing, because everyone knew that Mary and Joseph were together. Everyone knew. And they had announced it publicly. So to do it quietly, he was going to try and do it, but it's, it's, gonna, it's out there. Everyone knows there's going to be some rumors flying. Why would God choose such a seemingly sketchy way? It has all the appearances of being sketchy, right? All the appearances. Why would he choose such a seemingly sketchy way uh, to come into this world? Why a premarital conception? Out of all the different things. <laughs> Well, of course, we know God becoming human, um, he, he cannot have the sinful nature of humanity, right? God coming human has to be, basically needs an incubator <laughs> to come into the world. Human incubator, women, we are human incubators. Um, yes, but I wonder if there's more than that. I wonder if we step back and see the big picture of God throughout the history from the genealogy all the way through and through the whole scriptures, a God who is loving, a God who is good, a God who loves everyone, regardless of their situation, regardless, a God of grace. Um, people are made in the image of God, even when they make mistakes, right? Now, let's be clear. I'm not saying she made a mistake. I'm just saying it appeared that way, right? It appeared. Um, appearances aren't everything. And I... I was picking up this book by uh, Bob Goff, uh, reading Everybody, Love Everybody, or some, Everybody Something, Everybody Everything. Anyway, um, and he talks about how people are made in the image of God, and all people are made in his image, even the ones that you don't like, even the ones who don't agree with you, even the ones that are difficult people, we're all made in the image of God. And if we just, just hang out with the church people, the good ones, uh, who appear good, uh, who don't have any issues, then we're, we're missing out on this whole big group of people made in God's image. And therefore, we don't actually see the full image of God reflected in all his creation because we're kind of just hanging out over here with the good ones and we're not hanging out with the other ones that he also created in his image. And that really hit me because that is kind of how God appears. And I know, you know, as a church and the history of, of the Christian church, we've tended to really... Um, distance ourselves from people, young ladies, when they get pregnant, we're like, eh. I mean, some, some churches, you know, disfellowshipping, it's a real thing, and all of this whole thing. And then others decide, we're actually going to love this woman. We're going to throw her a baby shower, and we're going to support her because she's going to go through a hard time. Plus, she decided to have this child. That's rough. We're going we're gonna to surround her with kindness and love and compassion and shower her with gifts and bring her in and, and, and have some extra moms and fathers for this child because she's, she's going to need a lot of help. And, uh, you know, we have those two options, just like they did back then with Mary. They had, they had this option, two options. She could be stoned or Joseph could choose to 
bring her in and to love her and to support her um, now, to be clear. It appeared shady. It wasn't shady. <laughs> we know that. But I think that there's a reason God came that way, to challenge all of us a little bit, because what appears like we should throw stones at could actually be an opportunity for God to be revealed, his image to be revealed, his goodness to reve be revealed, and for a gift and a blessing to this world. So, it takes an act of God to change Joseph's mind. It takes an act of God. Now, I don't know about you ladies, but I know I have prayed for God to change my husband's mind before. I'm not the only one out there, right? <laughs> um, it's actually a good thing to do when you have an argument or, or, or like you're not seeing eye to eye or you have a difference of opinion to be like, okay, God, you know this guy. You talk to him. You guys have a relationship. So I'm just going to pray and you're going to talk to him and then he's going to change his mind, right? <laughs> And it actually works. I've done that before. I prayed, okay, God, I think I'm right on this, but I'm not going to convince him. So you convince him. And then he comes back and he's like, you know, God talked to me. We had a chat. And I'm pretty sure that that's, <laughs> that's the direction we should go. Like, yes. Yes, Jesus. Yes, God. So I imagine Mary prayed for Joseph and said, God, change his mind because I know what happened. I know how it happened. I know that you appeared to me and you said this is true. So you just have to change Joseph's mind because this is your, this is you. This is Emmanuel, God with us in my womb. God changed his mind. And what happened? God shows up in a dream. I mean, I'm using my holy imagination there, but bear with me. I think she prayed. And God shows up in a dream. Uh, through uh, God actually gives him a dream. Um, and it says an angel of the Lord appeared. We don't know which angel, most likely Gabriel, who, who appeared to her, but it doesn't say. And divine intervention convinces Joseph that Mary was actually telling the truth and that he should actually have this child and support her. God does unexpected things through unexpected people in unexpected ways. That's the whole story of Jesus' birth. Expect the unexpected when it comes to God, right? We want to think in our little, own little box of God, we put God in that box. We're like, this is how God is going to work. And God steps out of the box and says, um, no, <laughs> I will not be contained in a box. This is who I am. I am going to do what I want to do, through whom I'm going to do it, in the way that I want to do it. So my question is for you today, how is God at work around you? Is there someone that bears the image of God who is difficult uh, or different or seemingly kind of shady and God is calling you to love that person. God is calling you to care for that person. Maybe there's an angel in disguise. It says, you shall call his name Jesus, or Yeshua. This name of Jesus, the salvation of Yahweh. This was fairly common in those days. A lot of kids were named Jesus. But Jesus bears a special significance for you and I today, right? The salvation of Yahweh. And his purpose, it says right here, is to save us from our sins. Not to save from the Roman uh, invasion, the, the Roman oppression, but to save us from our sins. To change our hearts. To help us love those he wants us to love. To help us care for those he wants us to care for to save us from our sins. Not just the Jewish people, but all the people, the Savior of the world. And then I love how he, um, you know, the people that are reading this probably think it's kind of sketchy. Um, 
this whole birth, there was actually debate around the time about, well, maybe she conceived by a Roman soldier. Uh, that was kind of swirling around at that time. And Matthew just says it like it is, and he says, this is what happened. God worked in unexpected ways through an unexpected person to do an unexpected thing. And so he kind of just squashes all those rumors. And then he sticks in a proof text, because that's what we like to do, right? If we, if, we, um, if we think there's questions about something, we're just like, boom. And he's like, Old Testament, there you go. People, Jewish people, here is your Old Testament proof text to show that this is the way God works. We kind of have to zoom out a little bit from our box of how God should work, how he should act, what he should do, who he should use. Zoom out a little bit and see the big scope of scripture. And this text is evidence of how God uses unexpected things in unexpected ways, uses people to do unexpected things in unexpected ways. And it is, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And there's been some debate over this, some skepticism even to this day about, well, was she a virgin or was she a young woman? No, look at the Septuagint, it translates virgin. So therefore, this passage, and there's some more studies there that you can look at, but virgin shall conceive. Um, here's a virgin conceiving, Matthew says. Look, he said it. And he did it. So therefore, boom, Jewish people, you got to believe this is the Messiah. So what does God have to do to convince us that he can use unexpected people to do unexpected things in unexpected ways? To kind of believe that the impossible can happen. Let's all just zoom out today and see the big picture of God and his story on this Christmas day to see how he's working, to see how he is using unexpected people in unexpected ways to do unexpected things. Emmanuel, God with us. So what did Joseph do after that and Mary? It says... Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife, and they named him Jesus. It was a difficult thing, right? It wasn't easy. It was a difficult thing, but he decided to do it, and this is how he was just and righteous, because he followed God. When God said, do this thing that seems crazy, <laughs> this, believe this thing that's impossible, because I am at work. So why don't we be ready for the unexpected, you and I? Let's be ready for what God wants to do and who he wants to use, where he wants us to go, the situations he's calling us to, the events that he's planning. God is always up to something, and it always looks a bit different from what we had anticipated. Let's pray. Loving God, surprise us. <laughs> we ask you to do something unexpected in our lives, in our communities, in our homes. Call us to unexpected places where you are at work. Maybe it's on the street. Maybe it's with a friend who we didn't think believed in you. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, loving someone who made a mistake or whatever it may be. God, help us to trust you that you are at work around us in unexpected ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.